Come on, can we just celebrate all that God is doing in and through the church? Amazing. And again, to echo it, uh, way to go Northview at all of our locations. It is just wonderful to see uh, what God can do collectively as each and every one of us lean into the possibility that maybe, just maybe, God wants to use us uh, for purposes and for impact uh, beyond ourselves. Anyone thankful that God has a plan for your life? He has a vision for your life. And and it's leaning into the possibility that maybe, just maybe, he has more in store, more influence, more impact. And you and I get the opportunity to be a part of his story, to serve as a conduit of hope and agents of change and representations of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in our communities and around the world. And if you're new to Northview, whether you are watching online or you're at one of our campuses or you're in the room, uh, we're so thrilled that you would join us and you're going to get to know a lot about our church in this weekend because we are celebrating the culmination of our first initiative. And there's so much to cover. I even brought a podium out here with me today. I, I typically don't speak with a podium. I'm a no notes kind of guy, but there's so many dates, uh, dates and statistics and so many things that is like, I just need to be able to capture all of this well. And I'm a very sentimental person. This, this podium actually means a lot to me uh, prior to coming to uh, Northview, uh, I got to serve as a pastor in Minnesota, and I had the opportunity to be in a part of a church plant where I got to serve as the senior pastor. And it was just amazing to be uh, a part of this small group of people who had a desire to plant a church and to see all that God did in and through that local church and got to serve in that capacity for about a decade before God tapped me on the shoulder and, and came here. And it's funny because I think back to those days uh, coming into this weekend. I don't know what your spiritual journey has been like and your walk with Christ, uh, but this weekend has me standing in awe and amazement as to God's ability to uh, bring about things in and through our lives and to position us and allow us uh, to participate in things so much bigger than ourselves. Anyone just amazed by that? Like, God, you had such a better plan, a bigger plan, and it's been so fulfilling and exhilarating. And I can remember early on while we were uh, getting the church off the ground, we were meeting in a junior high, which fun fact, there was a lady by the name of Debbie Pano, who was married to a man by the name of Tracy Pano, whose older brother planted Northview Church. And Debbie Pano was the theater director at this junior high school. And she made a way uh, for our church plant to begin meeting in this junior high there in Minneapolis. And I, I loved it. We would show up every single week and we would set up and tear down church. And I had the privilege of getting to pick up the trailer every single week. And there was a church nearby that would allow us to park our trailer in their parking lot. The challenge was is throughout the week as Minnesota snows would come and winter would last for about five to six months up there. Uh, every time I would show up in the morning, uh, our trailer would be snowed in. Uh, I'd get up around 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning. I'd go out there and I'd, I'd shovel out the trailer and we have one of these locks on the trailer. And it would obviously be frozen due to slush and snow. And I would have to carry this blowtorch in the back of our car. And so I would sit out there at five in the morning, blowtorch in the, this lock off the tongue. And I'd have to hammer it off. And uh, we would pull the trailer around. And what was funny about that season is there in the junior high school, they had these music stands that I would use as a podium. But every time I would put my Bible on it, uh, the music stand would just kind of shrink down. And so finally, I was like, I need to get something more sturdier to hold my Bible. And so an individual in our church found these two pieces of scrap wood outside of a cabinet store. And another guy had some uh, scrap metal from a, a welding company that he had. And so they put together this podium for me. And it didn't fit in the trailer. And so back then, I would show up to church, like walking in, carrying my pulpit. And, and this is how I was every single week. And it, it was just amazing. And when I came here, uh, the elders gifted me this pulpit and from, from Minnesota. So pretty neat. So if you think I'm unimpressive now, you should have seen me then. It was, uh, it was pretty bad, but I'm just so thankful because you just never know what God is going to do in and through your life. And it's funny, when I, I first got here, over time, I just stopped preaching at a pulpit. I would just share what's ever on my heart. And, uh, you know, you, Sometimes on social media, you have to stay away from the comment section because it can be pretty toxic out there. But sometimes it's also pretty comical. And one time the team brought me this snapshot of some comments about me online. They said, hey, you got to see these. And one lady said, this guy's not even a real pastor. He doesn't even use a pulpit. And uh, <laughs> someone put right beneath it, it said, yeah, all he does is give TED Talks. He doesn't even teach the Bible. 
uh, which, uh, you know, people can just make stuff up because if you've ever been to Northview, uh, you know, every single week we do a deep dive into scripture and we love God's work. And I get an amen and we just study it vigorously, but it just cracks me up. And I, I was thinking about that season that we were in early on as a church. There was this time we were going to say, hey, let's, let's try to uh, move into a high school, a bigger space so we can continue growing. At the time, we were maybe like 150, 200 people. And we had this vision of what would it look like if we got into a high school auditorium so we could provide a, big, uh, a bigger and better experience for the community. And we, we put the numbers together. And as a church plant, you're operating on a shoestring budget. And it was going to cost us about $25,000 to make the move. And at the time, we're uh, made up of young families, a lot of new believers. And uh, we needed to raise $25,000 above and beyond uh, our normal giving. And that was a, a daunting idea. And so the weekend comes for us to receive the offering. And uh, we, we received the offering. And it's funny, in my office, I got this picture uh, of in my office. This is on a shelf. And uh, one of my favorite animal, the rhino, uh, which has terrible eyesight, but pretty fast and pretty strong. It just knows whatever it comes in contact with, it's going to destroy it. I think that's an illustration of faith. Obviously, you got to have Larry Bird, uh, the Indiana State bobblehead. People think the C is for my name, which is so narcissistic. Uh, it's actually as a reminder to pray for the capital C church is what that is. But uh, here is the, the offering total that the ushers passed to me uh, that morning. So they, they came forward, and at the end of the service, I got to go up there and make an announcement. And like most services after worship, someone comes up, they receive the offering Then I came up to preach. And I've held on to this for now, I don't know, 15 years, uh, because if you zoom in on it, what was great is the original total that came in the offering uh, was $17,000. And as I was preaching, uh, people just started walking to the back to the ushers, giving more money. And the total that weekend uh, was $38,000. And it, it just... I remember thinking to myself, I can't believe <laughs> I get to be a part of a church that just gave $38,000. <laughs> My mind was blown. And you stick with it long enough, you stay faithful, and you discover uh, a lot of times God's goodness is only a hint at how much more he has in store for your life. And uh, I look back on that, and now I get to be a part of a church that is going to be celebrating a kingdom impact that I personally never thought I'd ever get the opportunity to be a part of and a, to be a part of a team that is uh, doing such remarkable things at such large levels uh, around the world. And can we just celebrate what God has done in and through the first initiative? The, the impact is insane. And, and we're going to give you a lot of numbers that are going to make this one uh, seem so minimal. Uh, and I, I just pray that the magnitude of it rests accurately upon your heart. Like, whoa, look at what God did uh, in such a short period of time uh, through our, our community of faith. We launched this uh, initiative two years ago, the first initiative. And, you know, Pastor Steve was the, the spearhead on it all. He kind of got the party started. And anyone just love Pastor Steve? Can we just show them love for him and his faith on the way out? It was outstanding. There was one time he preached a message on the Macedonian church, and he talked about how in Scripture it says the Macedonian church, despite severe trials and extreme poverty, they welled up in rich generosity, and they were extremely generous despite their circumstances. And I think about that, and I'm like, man, I, I think in some ways our, our church can relate to that. There are some dynamics that certainly could have uh, come against the faithfulness and the productivity and the generosity of our church when we launched the first initiative, if you think back to really 2021, when this was starting to take shape, uh, we were still coming out of COVID. Most churches didn't know, hey, what is life going to be like beyond COVID? There were still a lot of COVID practices in place in our community. And that was a, certainly a thing. In addition to coming out of COVID, we were stepping into succession. Uh, which if you talk to church specialists, uh, do an, a capital campaign in the middle of a leadership transition is not always the best idea. In fact, we couldn't find anyone else who had done it, uh, but we just felt that this is what God had in mind for the church. And so we leaned in. And so you had this living legend uh, passing the baton to some knucklehead who no one knew. And it was like, all right, if God said it, so be it. Uh, we believe it. And then you have the things taking place within our culture and an unstable economy and then a couple unflattering articles. And it's like, man, there's so many things that could uh, derail our church and keep us off focus uh, from what God has in store for us. And 
to see the, the faithfulness and, and just the radical generosity and the sacrifice uh, of this community. And if you're new, you should just know you are seated next to some remarkable people, like true followers of Christ who live and look and act like Jesus week in and week out, who are accomplishing uh, his purpose in the world uh, in remarkable ways. And I'm just so impressed by our church. And Pastor Steve, he, he started off in this first initiative, and the whole idea came from something that Paul says in the book of Colossians. And if you have your Bibles, we'll, we'll just read really the anchor verse that got the whole first initiative started as we bring this to a, a close and culmination. It says in verse 15, the son, talking about Jesus, right? We, we believe in a triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Uh, the son, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. And here was the anchor verse. He is before all things and in him, all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn among the dead so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. That is a, a fantastic passage. Some commentaries believe that uh, this was actually a hymn, that this was a song of worship for the early church. And whether or not this was a song that was sung in worship, this is certainly a verse that should produce worship. When, when you lean into what it is declaring about our God and who Christ is, it should move your heart and it should align your mind to the reality of who our God is and his capability and his desire in and through your life. And Paul is writing this letter. Paul is writing it to a church in Colossae. It's not a church that he personally planted, but it's a church that he has received word from. Paul is actually writing this letter on house arrest. And he gets word of some things that Colossae, the church in Colossae is going through. And the thing that is paramount and most concerning to Paul is there is a false teaching that is beginning to have its way within the community of believers. And essentially what it was is it was a combination of what would be known as Greek mysticism combined with Jewish legalism. Now, around the first or second century, this would then become identified as Gnosticism. But essentially, the idea was they were making less of Jesus, that Jesus wasn't the Son of God. In fact, they would claim that uh, Jesus was an angelic emanation, emanation of God, that they denied both his humanity and his deity. And what you can find is all throughout human history, there has been an attempt from Gnosticism to postmodernism. There will always be an attempt to make less of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Have you found this to be the case? That there will be an agenda or for whatever reasons, others will assume that Jesus just isn't quite good enough. He doesn't quite meet the mark of what we're in store for. And really, this is the original temptation in the garden. In the book of Genesis, what do you have Satan tempting Adam and Eve with? This idea that God's holding out on them. Hey, hey, God is holding out on you. There's something that he's keeping from you. And so assuming that God's holding out on them, they fall into error. And the church in Colossae is doing the same thing. And I'm telling you, you and I will fall into error as well when we start to assume that our God uh, has ill intentions and holds out on his people. And Paul comes out and what I love about Paul's address to the church in Colossae is he doesn't come out with a refutation of the heirs. Instead, he comes out with a declaration of the truth. He doesn't even come out trying to address all the different angles and layers to the heirs. He just comes out unapologetically, boldly declaring who Jesus is. And there will always be an attempt to make less of Jesus. And I'm just telling you, uh, it, it's a huge error. And I do believe you get down the road and you realize, oh man, that was some faulty thinking. 
I have always been fascinated with Billy Graham and his legacy. Wave at me if you just uh, admire Billy Graham and his work throughout the world. It's a wonderful legacy. And Billy Graham had a, an associate by the name of Charles Templeton. Have you ever heard of Charles Templeton? Charles Templeton early on was a, a really key figure in Billy Graham's ministry. In fact, he was a great preacher. He would share the pulpit and, and would speak to packed out stadiums right alongside Billy Graham. And eventually, Charles Templeton goes through this crisis in his faith. So much so, he decides to walk away from his faith. He abandons his beliefs altogether. And he takes it as far as writing a book called Farewell God. And Farewell to God. And he goes into great detail as to why he no longer believes in God. And it's just a wild turn of events. This guy who believed in Christ, this individual who preached Christ, goes through a crisis and abandons Christ. Well, he gets down the road and he's about 80 years old and he's in an interview and someone's interviewing him on, you know, just his participation in the Billy Graham Association and his participation in advancing the gospel around the world, but then his deviation from those things. And they start asking him these questions and asking him questions about his book and asking him questions about how life panned out. And at one point, the interviewer said, so after all is said and done, what do you make of Jesus? Who do you think Jesus is? And he has this quote. It says, he was the greatest man, the greatest human being who has ever lived. He was a moral genius. His ethical sense was unique. He was intrinsically the wisest person that I've ever encountered in my life or in my readings. He's the most important thing in my life. I know it may sound strange, but I have to say I adore him. Everything good I know, everything decent I know, everything pure I know, I learned from Jesus. He is the most important human being who ever existed. And if I may put it this way, I miss him. And the interviewer says after that statement, uh, he began to weep and uh, would not answer any more questions. This individual gets all the way down the road and reflects on his deviation from Christ and realizes uh, when I think of the goodness in my life and the wisdom in my life, and I think of the things that had the most positive impact in my life, I, I can't help but recognize it, it was Christ. And now that I think about it, man, do I miss him. What a statement. And, and my prayer is no matter who you are, no matter what you're going through, just know uh, life is hard. It's unfair. It comes with inconvenience. You don't have to go looking for trouble. Trouble knows where to find you. Uh, but I pray you don't get duped by the crisis in your life, that you walk away from the goodness of our God, that he's faithful, that he's remarkable, and he's for you. And Paul is making it very clear, folks, Jesus is a big deal. Look at your neighbor and say, Jesus is a big deal. He is a big deal. And as we bring this first initiative to its end, Really, the goal in all of it is not so much that uh, we close it down or shut down the operation as much as it is to say we've spent two years developing a muscle and a posture and a habit that moving forward, uh, we will carry this mentality and this approach to our faith forward, that he is first, that he is preeminent. The church in Colossae uh, would say that Jesus was prominent, but not preeminent. And Paul's like, no, 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 no. He is a big deal. He is the priority, and he comes first before all things. And the question might be, well, why should Jesus be first? Why should you devote your life to anchoring him as the focal point of your being? Why should he be first? And four really just quick reasons why you should always keep Jesus first. And the first one is Jesus is the revealer of the Father. Paul comes right out and he says, the son is the image of the invisible God. Jesus would actually make this statement as he would go throughout the region saying, one of the primary purposes of my life is to reveal what the father is like because he shows up in a hyper-religious context and it is very apparent all these religious folks have a caricature of God, but they don't understand the character of God. You know those cartoon drawings that kind of look like a person, but they're a little goofy? 
Yeah, well, Jesus shows up in a religious face. He's like, yeah, you kind of got this uh, goofy version of God. I have come so you may know what the Father is like. And some people will push back on this and they'll say, well, that doesn't make any sense. If you read the Old Testament and then you compare it to the New Testament, in very real ways, it seems like you're talking about two different gods. God in the Old Testament is intimidating. In fact, the things you read in the Old Testament can make you feel uncomfortable. And then you see this suffering servant arrive in the New Testament. How are they the same? And really what is tragic is to see how many people read the Old Testament and they do not see all the tender mercy and the grace and the steadfast patience and forbearance and just goodness of our God. But really what is tripping people up when they look at the Old Testament compared to the New Testament is the New Testament in terms of time. So both the Old Testament and the New Testament summarize a segment of time in history. Does that make sense? Well, the New Testament only represents about 2% of time compared to the Old Testament. So, you know, some commentators say, would, would say dating back to Adam and Eve, the Old Testament uh, could cover up to 4,000 years, where the New Testament covers about 90 years. And so when you cover such a vast amount of time, summarizing its details uh, make them more appalling or sometimes more stark. Uh, but really, it is the same God. Jesus is the revealer of the Father. In fact, you could do an exercise. I had a professor in school once do this, and he duped all of us, so don't beat yourself up. But he said, hey, everyone just close your eyes for a second and envision what does God look like? In your mind, how do you see God? And he would have us write them down. And what was funny is almost everyone in the class had a very similar portrait in their mind of God. He was someone who looked like Zeus. He had this uh, really flowy, long gray hair with a beard and some big muscles. And, you know, he, he just looked like Zeus. And he was uh, somewhere in his 60s, you know, is what our assumption was. And my professor said, when you close your eyes and you envision God the Father, if you don't see Jesus, you've got the wrong portrait. And this is what Paul is saying. He's saying Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He is the revealer of the Father. And when you look at Jesus, you should be reminded of how much your God is for you, how much God loves you, and the, the heavenly Father uh, who has adopted each and every single one of us into his family as we place our faith in Christ. He's the revealer of the Father. Secondly, Jesus is the creator of the universe. And understanding that he is creator is, is significant. In fact, it's profound because what you find in our world is there is a popular and growing belief that everything in this world is just random. It all happened by accident and nothing has purpose or meaning or reasoning. And here's the thing. The moment you live in a world that's random and accidental, that has no purpose or meaning or reasoning, well, what does that mean for your life? You're random. You're accidental. You have no purpose. You have no meaning. And there's no reason for you to be here. And suddenly, when you embrace that frame of mind, well, what do you end up with? People who walk through life with massive confusion, going through constant identity crisis, and, and just spoiling what is before them and mismanaging and misstewarding the life that they've been given. But what we find in creation is uh, God's remarkable, mysterious, brilliant, creative, wonderful uh, thumbprint on everything that he is the one who hung the stars and stacked the mountains and dug out the valleys and filled it with water and created the oceans. Like he, he did it all. He is the architect of heaven and the created world. It makes sense. This is why I love talking to engineers and mathematicians because they can look at creation and be like, well, well this thing makes sense. There's clearly Einstein would say a big brain behind all this. And that's wonderful because when you, when you look at creation, maybe when you stare out into the stars or you hike a mountain or you just sit on the beach staring at the ocean and you're filled with a sense of awe and wonder as to, whoa, God is amazing. And look at his creation. It should come with the prompting. It should come with the question, if my God created something as amazing as this, what amazing things does he desire to do in through my life? What has he created me for? Because scripture makes an outlandish claim. Uh, it's wild to even think about that in God's entire creation, you and I are his centerpiece. 
You and I are the part of his work that he takes the most pride in. He is the creator. And when you understand that everything is from him and for him, and if he designed it, he defines it. And he is the creator of the universe. In addition to that, Jesus is the sustainer of the world. Now, I love the statement where it says he holds it together. You ever lost your composure or you were around someone who lost their composure? And what did you say? Man, hold it together. You ever heard that before? Like hold it together. Uh, life comes with moments that jolt us and it is hard to maintain a poise. But have you discovered there will come times? I don't care how strong you are, how bright you are, how wealthy you are, how talented you are. There will come a time uh, when you can't hold it together where the pain is too great and the burden is too heavy and the confusion is too bewildering. And there is something about our God that when life gets out of our control, we stand under his goodness and his covering and somehow he holds it together. Anyone thankful for a God who, who holds it together, who sustains us through trials and sustains us through storms? He, he is a wonderful God. He is the sustainer of the world. And, and I love reading history books and novels and there's this old historian by the name of H.G. Wells, who was a known atheist. And he wrote extensively about history and was once asked, well, as someone who has done so much work historically, what do you make of Jesus? And he said this as an atheist, but a historian. He says, a historian like myself, who doesn't even call himself a Christian, finds the picture centering irresistibly around the life and character of this most significant man. The historian's test of an individual's greatness is what did he leave to grow? Did he start men to thinking along fresh lines with vigor that persisted after him? By this test, Jesus stands first. He's saying, I, I, I don't necessarily believe him as Lord and Savior. But when I look at uh, human history, there's no question. Nobody has had a greater impact. Nobody has brought about more redemptive and positive change. Nobody has left a long, longer standing and greater legacy than Jesus. He says it, it centers on this most significant man. I love that. Did, the test of a historian is, did he put something in the hearts of people that lasted beyond him? Jesus put the call to discipleship uh, within the hearts of his original disciples. And we talked about last week how that mission has jumped oceans and touched down on every continent around the world. It is, it is truly outstanding. But lastly, Jesus is the director of the church. Jesus is the director of the church. This is why uh, it is a terrible miss within the local church for any one of us to get too excited about man's leadership. The moment our focus becomes an individual's leadership and we stop focusing on Christ's lordship, it's a terrible miss in any church. In fact, that's a root of a lot of disgusting things that make their way into communities of faith. It is about the lordship of Jesus Christ, that he is the head of the church and leaders come and go and batons get passed, but he remains immovable upon his throne with a sovereign plan and he is faithful to his bride. Anyone thankful for a God who is the head of his church? He is the head. And that is an amazing thing. And as we continue to move forward as a church, and we're 44 years old, we're, we're approaching that 50 mark, the, the goal and the focus will always be uh, chasing after the Lordship of Jesus Christ and acknowledging him as the head of the church. He is the head. And just know this, we live in a world that wants to take the head off. And just know this, when the world swings at the head, sometimes it hits the body. And so we are joined with Christ in his afflictions. Uh, but Paul says it is all to bring honor and glory to him. Amen. Uh, we honor him as the head. We launched this first initiative and our emphasis and focus was broken down into three categories in our church, in our community and in our world. And Folks, I, I'm terrible at this kind of stuff. If you've been around, I'm not really good at the detail stuff of announcements, but it would be a miss not to inform you as to the impact that you've had in our community and around the world because of your generosity. And so a lot of statistics, we've, we've tried to narrow it down. This could probably go on for, for hours as to the things that have been taking place in and through our church over the last couple of years. But 
A couple things to point out. One, in our church, we launched Better Together. Can we just show some love for the marriage initiative and all that God has done through Better Together? It is wonderful that at all of our campuses, the Better Together influence is just having a tremendous impact. Over $700,000 has been invested into marriages here within our communities. 110 couples have gone through Becoming One, our premarital uh, program. We have offered 120 date nights uh, through this initiative, and 90 couples have attended the Hopeful Tomorrow uh, Marriage Weekend, which this is amazing. These are individuals who show up, many with divorce papers in hand, contemplating, and many with the decision already in their heart that this marriage is coming to an end. And hear this number. As of now, 86% of couples who have come up to our Hopeful Tomorrow uh, weekends have recommitted to their marriages. Is that not just unreal? And so proud of Better Together. 5,200 people attended the comedy nights, and it's, it's so fun to see. And a question that you might have is, hey, now that first is coming to an end, what happens with Better Together? Well, uh, folks, just to set the record straight, uh, Better Together is just getting started. And we as a church are going to remain aggressive and intentional and invested into the marriages within our communities. And we're so proud of the team and proud of all the leaders. Uh, way to go, everybody. Yeah. In addition to that, we launched That Girl and Valor, uh, our new women's and men's initiatives, and thousands of uh, men and women have shown up to these events, and monthly gatherings have been launched at our campuses, and small groups are being formed through those initiatives, and it's amazing to see what's happening already through that girl and Valor. Probably the thing that I'm most impressed with, and in fact, it was fun to even see it in the video. In the video, it says we've paid off $11.5 million in debt. Is that not outstanding? $11.5 million in debt. Our goal, and it will remain our goal, is to be uh, completely debt-free uh, by 2025. Well, when that video was being produced, and it takes time to put some of those things together, we were sitting at $11.5 million in debt. But since that video was produced, uh, we've been able to pay off another $1.5 million. So we sit at $13 million paid off in debt. Is that not just outstanding? Way to go, Northview. In terms of in our community, uh, we launched our Northview Network because we don't just believe uh, in our church, we believe in the church. It's a huge miss if you just get so uh, loyal to uh, uh, one church that you overlook the importance of all of us working simultaneously together. And folks, uh, we're just blessed with amazing churches in our community and around our state who are doing a bang up job for Christ. And we just love linking arms with them. And if you find that Northview is not a good fit for you, you're in a good place uh, because there are so many other great churches in our community. Just get in where you fit in and just be a part of the, the community of faith. And right now, uh, we have over 100 churches in our area now in the Northview Network where our staff, week in and week out, is resourcing them. We tell them if we have it, you can have it. And so all of our systems and different things that we put out are made available to uh, the different churches. And then we get to also learn from them. It's a great partnership. And to see what is happening through the Northview Network it is just amazing. In addition to that, we launched our Noblesville campus. Can we show some love for our Noblesville campus? All of those out there. So fun to see new churches popping up. We have also continued our longstanding partnership with Brookside. Brookside uh, was a, a community, uh, it's a church that has a outreach focus within the city that was birthed out of Northview, and it continues to do uh, amazing things. In uh, 2023, we opened up the Isaiah House uh, for women and children, which is amazing to provide them a place to reside in when life gets uh, complicated. We also opened up the Refuge Center, which is a violence interrupter. It provides space for those who are caught in violent situations and those who are uh, really in the darkest of moments. We pr provide them a place of hope and, and comfort and peace. Is that not just amazing to see what is happening through Brookside? And so excited to see those facilities now open. We also, once again, hosted a special needs prom. And come on, can we just got to show some love? Uh, all the. The families and individuals, 500 of you actually showed up and served to make this evening possible. We had over 455 guests uh, throughout central Indiana, and that is outstanding because a majority of them do not call Northview home. Uh, these are individuals throughout our community, families uh, who uh, got to show up and just have a great experience, and only 16 of them actually 
called Northview Home. And I love that we are just having an impact and adding value to the community. We served over 135 parents and guardians uh, during the prom as well. Can we just shout out our volunteers? This year during Easter, we, we hosted again uh, Easter egg hunts, which is just a way to say, hey, God's blessed us with property, and we just want to add value to the community and make it a place that you know, provides life and joy because there's so much despair and frustration out in the world. And at eight of our campuses, we had 475 volunteers uh, participate in providing Easter egg hunts with over 2,000 people showing up and being served at those events. Uh, so once again, way to go Northview and just serving the community. We have continued our partnership with God Behind Bars. God Behind Bars is uh, the organization that has helped us launch our three pr prison locations. And can we show some love to our, our prison locations? Uh, we are so proud of all of you. And I, I love this because, you know, when, when things happen in a prison and, and things do happen, uh, it complicates our ability to meet and we have to kind of adjust on the fly. And the teams that work behind the, the prison walls really just uh, do a great job. And the leaders who are emerging in that uh, are just amazing. But in 2024 alone, just uh, in the few short months that we have in this year, uh, we have seen 36 individuals give their life to Christ and 34 baptized uh, going public in their faith. I just think that is so awesome. Way to go. Those of you who are at our prison locations. I also love that we are partnering with uh, 27 local partnerships, local organizations uh, that we are constantly investing into, uh, that there are organizations that add significant value uh, to our community that if they just had the resources, they could uh, continue adding uh, more value and having a greater impact. Anyone just thankful for uh, like-minded organizations who care deeply about our communities? And one of my favorite details is the fact that we are partnering with 25, uh, I'm sorry, nine elementary schools and that we're serving and just meeting whatever needs that they have. But some organizations, I can't list them all, but some that are near and dear to many of you and you serve and you give to be a part of this is the Carmel Youth Assistance Program, the Fishers Youth Assistance Program, a Circle City Relief, a Neighborhood Christian Legal Clinic, Ascent 121, Wheeler Mission Life Centers. Uh, we have uh, SAWS, which is Servants at Work, Food for Souls, Lafayette Transitional Housing Center, Hands of Hope, Grace Mobile Food Pantry, Kokomo Rescue Mission, Valley of Grace, Operation Love, Good Samaritan Network, and the Narrow Gate Horse Ranch that provides therapy to individuals. Can we just show all of our partners our love and appreciation for what they do. And so if, if you've been given to the first initiative, know that you, you've been given to all those organizations that we, we just mentioned. A lot is happening in our community. And in our world, we, we got the party started last weekend talking about Bright Hope and the documentary. And wasn't the documentary just great what the team put together? And so fun to see the, the impact and the traction that that is already gaining. In this year, uh, we have had in this initiative. We've had 34 trips go out around the world, 375 individuals, boots on the ground on different continents and different cultures to serve people and to advance the cause of Christ. We financially support 26 missionary families, which is so critical. A lot of times people love to give the projects and programs, but if you don't have the person on the ground willing, willing to lead it and carry it out, uh, it doesn't come to pass. And as a church, we, we take care of the livelihood of these leaders so they can serve faithfully in tough situations. And anyone just love our missionaries and their, their commitment to the call of Christ on their life. And so amazing. In addition to them, we have 20 global partners that we invest in greatly. And we celebrated last week that $7.8 million has gone to, to missions to have an impact around the world. $7.8 million, folks. That is hard to get my mind around. Um, to give a shout out to some of our organizations, there is uh, Bright Hope, Nehemiah Vision Ministries. There's One Hope uh, Venture. There is International Justice Mission. There is World Vision, Filter of Hope. There is City Center, Convoy of Hope, uh, Priority One, Fire Bible, Bible Translations, Mission to Ukraine, Children's Hope Chest, Eden's Children's Home, uh, Nadej, as well as SOS, and, and the list goes on and on of organizations uh, really doing a bang up job to reach those around the world. And last week we talked about Bright Hope, and I love how they partner with 27 churches right now to, to raise up national leaders. 
And one of my favorite statistics is through their work, they have trained 587 pastors, national leaders now positioned and poised uh, to have a kingdom impact on their community and their nation. Yeah, it's outstanding. They gave us this number that is staggering. In fact, it makes me think I got to step my game up. Of these 587 pastors, 165,000 lives have been impacted uh, through their faithful service. That's just unbelievable. Um, yeah. We're also celebrating that of these 27 churches, eight of these local churches have now become self-sustaining, which once you have a healthy church, uh, you can just begin to multiply in ways that are fruitful to the community. World Vision and our work in Ghana continues to amaze me. We have provided clean water uh, to 21,000 people in Ghana through the first initiative in World Vision. I, I mean, we, we take clean water for granted. We wake up in the morning, we let the, the shower run for 10 minutes while we go to get our coffee, whatever your routine is. Uh, but there are people who did not have access to clean water and the illnesses that come with that. And now every single day, uh, they are waking up with clean water uh, and it is because of your faithfulness. 21,000 people provide a clean water because of your generosity in 13 villages. Now 13 villages that can raise crops and uh, fight against the illnesses. One number that will not be captured in the, the financial total of the first initiative because it's not a transaction that ran through Northview, but I do think it deserves uh, some celebration. Uh, during all of this, if you remember, we hosted a chosen weekend. Uh, where we partnered with World Vision in their child sponsorship initiative. In fact, we broke the record for World Vision. We as a church sponsored 2,648 children. And it's really amazing when you think about it. Yeah, you can give God some praise for that. In the two years that we have uh, been in this partnership and sponsoring, uh, we have uh, through sponsorship, given through World Vision, in addition to what we gave through the first initiative, uh, $2.4 million uh, to providing safe and productive environments for kids and their communities. Uh, that's just outstanding, church. Filter of Hope, uh, 13 teams, 158 uh, participants have gone on trips with them. 645 filters given. 240 individuals have made decisions uh, to follow Christ and to receive him as Lord and Savior. I just am so proud of Filter of Hope and those who have been on teams. In addition to that, they really wanted to uh, devote some attention to the, what is known as the 1040 window. The 1040 window is the, the place within the globe that has the most unreached people. In fact, the, at times the most hostile environments to the gospel. If there's a place that is difficult to reach people for Christ, uh, it is in the 1040 window. And they shared this initiative with us. And in addition to our commitment, we gave them an additional $300,000. And they recently reported back to us. We weren't the only church that participated, but with that $300,000 uh, investment, we were able to part, uh, be a part of 11,000 individuals within the 1040 window giving their life to Christ. Uh, 11,000 people. It's in a place where it couldn't happen, shouldn't happen, wouldn't happen, folks, it's happening. And it's because of God's goodness. Uh, again, to just button up some of these big numbers, coming from the guy who once took an offering that came in for $38,000 and it blew my mind. <laughs> our, our church is given $7.8 million to missions, paid off $13 million in debt, and in total given $67 million to advance the cause of Christ. I cannot get my mind around that. I cannot get my mind around it. 